ओके जय भीम एवरी वन इट मेक्स मी एक्सट्रीमली फॉर्चुनेट टू हैव यू ऑल हियर दिस इज समीक्षा पर्सिंग माई मास्टर्स इन सोशल वर्क एट टेस्ट उर्जापुर टूडे आई अलॉन्ग विथ माई कलिग आर्या विल बी मॉडरेटिंग दिस सेशन आर्या विल इंट्रोड्यूस यूर सेल्फ Uh, Jai Bhim, everyone. I'm Arya Oke. I'm originally from Nagpur, Maharashtra, but currently I'm doing my uh, integrated MSc in economics from University B R Ambedkar School of Economics, and I'm really glad to be a part of this event. Okay. Thank you, Arya. We are pleased to greet you all on the third day of Ambedkar Intellectual Summit 2024, which has been organized and honored to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's. Hundred and thirty third birthday. Here, we gathered together as a community to honor his scholarly contribution to the Indian society and his ongoing inspiration to us. Going ahead, we had Dr. Sylvia Karpagam with us today. Dr. Sylvia Karpagam is a public community health doctor and researcher who has been working for twenty years on access to healthcare. This include regulation on private sectors. and social determinants from a right perspective with the community networks and human right organization she had worked on issues related to the policies through the research training and writing as well as speaking to the media as a part of larger campaign on a right to nutrition she had participate in finding visits training and advocacy she is on expert community of alif 2020 which is interdisciplinary and international initiative constituted of 43 research project additionally she has collaborated with the community health workers activists lawyers and researchers to gather data to support policy maker positions on caste nutrition health and lives of those whose stories are frequently left out from a mainstream media we are privileged to have uh, have a doctor who is not only an excellent practitioner of a community health care on and to the top of it she is a very talented artist with all her abilities participant here are some instructions the session will be last for 45 minutes we kindly request you to keep your mic on mute and after that the floor will be open for the question and answer session so without further ado let's jump right into what seems to be an informative session with dr silvia karpagam on public health and ambedkarism Over to you, ma'am. Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank the your group that is the Ambedkar Intellectual Summit for um, having these events because uh, I think they are very important. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was when I was doing the research for the uh, you know when I was doing for the the research for this program. Uh, for this talk i realized that uh, there is been no talk actually among public health circles and uh, you know among people who are working on social determinants of health you know whether it's right to food or you know right to shelter the about dr ambedkar and his contribution to this and i think it was a kind of uh, uh, you know tendency to project him as you know anti caste and then leave him at that rather than as someone who has You know, contributed to these areas as well, and I also want to thank uh, Dr. Prashant Ambade, Dr. Kiran Kumbar, and Professor Jadumani Mahanand, uh, who through whose research I actually came to know uh, about some of these. And uh, to quote uh, Dr. Prashant Ambade, he says that Dr. Ambedkar's uh, Mahat Satyagra of 1927 was not just a struggle for access to water. um in an attempt to abolish untouchability but is it was also a struggle to ensure public health and that he was a fierce public health advocate someone has raised their hand should i continue or Uh, am i audible ma'am go ahead we will take the questions after your talk is over yeah yeah okay fine yeah okay um and um, um looking at some of the barriers to public health in india so i'm i've just mentioned a few 
uh, in the context of this discussion today, there are of course many more uh, barriers. Uh, one is of course uh, that not enough importance is given to the social determinants of health. Uh, there, is, there is a more a focus on access to healthcare, to medicines, to drugs, uh, to hospitals, um, and not much on these, what we call the social determinants, uh, which we'll discuss a little later. There's also an absence of fraternity um, because public health is about fraternity. And I think the COVID pandemic made many of these very visible um, that um, unless we look out for each other, not just our physical neighbors, but people, you know, outside our communities, outside our, uh, you know, enclosed spaces, uh, outside um, our, uh, you know, areas that we are comfortable with, uh, we are not going to be able to address many of the public health issues of the country. Also, uh, we have a lot of comfort with hierarchy and discrimination. So um, that's the normal uh, existence and normal state of being uh, for most of us, um, you know, in the country. And uh, again, that itself by itself is a barrier to uh, public health. There's also a disrespect and disregard of a common uh, go goods, whether it's public institutions or spaces or resources or assets. Um, and again, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, I'll share his quote later. He talks about equity, which is much more important <clears throat> than equality. So basically, uh, it's not about giving everybody an equal share, but it's giving more to people who need more. And I think that concept is very much uh, uh, poor in India. In fact, there's a lot of resentment uh, to, you know, uh, leave alone equity, even to equality, there's a lot of resentment. Again, that translates to the kind of hatred that we see uh, against reservation. And uh, science takes a backseat. Often it is religion, it is caste, it is uh, propaganda, it is prejudice, uh, which, uh, you know, becomes more important in decision making um, rather than evidence or science. And then the system, uh, if you look at it, the healthcare system, there's discrimination within the system and also by the system. So looking at some of the social determinants of health, again, I'm not looking at all. So we have education, uh, which has been documented again and again. A lot of research shows that the more educated a woman is, um, the better her health, the better the health of her children, the better her nutritional status, that of her children. Um, she is more likely to have, you know, access to income, uh, to the internet, to knowledge, uh, to information. But uh, the education system again is uh, hugely inaccessible, and it's not by, uh, you know, by accident. Very often, uh, it's deliberate. Um, uh, caste uh, plays a very strong role uh, in, you know, how public institutions are run the kind of value that is placed on them, the kind of investments that are made on them. Um, and we see a lot of countries where there is, you know, egalitarian uh, public uh, educational systems uh, or most of their public health outcomes are also better. And again, if you look at shelter, um, it's a very important social determinant, determinant of health. So we were actually involved in an eviction that happened uh, like close to my house in Bangalore. And we saw like within about, you know, three or four weeks, people who are completely um, healthy, who are working, um, once their houses were destroyed uh, because of these evictions, uh, they, you know, became sick. The senior citizens lost access to medications. Um, children became, started having more respiratory infections, more diarrheal diseases, malnutrition went up. Uh, women started having a lot of uh, health-related issues. Alcoholism in men went up, domestic violence went up. And, uh, uh, you know, we see that even, you know, in cities like Bangalore and some of the cities that we call smart cities, uh, there's no place uh, for people who, they, you want people to provide you services, but you don't want them to live there with you. So there's this, what we call the urban casteism, where you keep pushing people further and further outside the city. Um, you know, it's a kind of urban colonies uh, that are created. And because of this, uh, people generally tend to have, uh, so, so if you're located in one place and suddenly you're made to shift outside uh, to an unfamiliar place, 
uh, your uh, you, you lose access to livelihood the children's education gets affected your community social support gets affected and all of these are known to affect people's uh, you know access to health and again livelihood is very important um <clears throat> uh, we saw you know during the covid pandemic uh, you know overnight an order was passed that um, uh, it, you know there'll be a very rigorous rigorous lockdown but then we have people who uh, need to go out for daily wages and you know their livelihoods got affected and because they had to go out they became more vulnerable uh, to you know the exposure to the virus and you know to a host of whole lot of other problems sanitation is again very closely connected to public health uh, but as we know it is, it's again very closely linked with the caste and uh, you know a lot of people don't even clean their own toilets uh, they don't even want to handle their own excreta. Um, they have a hierarchical system. Uh, we're still in a country like India. We have people uh, doing um, manual scavenging uh, where they go into these sewers. Uh, you know, a country which claims to be very developed, very advanced, very modernized. Uh, it's completely inhuman and shameful that we still have this whole um, system of... Uh, you know, it's a very primitive kind of uh, sanitation system. There's been no effort to modernize it. Um, again, whether it's sewage uh, or even dry waste, the, there's very little uh, concern in terms of, uh, you know, how the dry waste is dis uh, uh, disposed of. Uh, we see a lot of... Uh, you know, vehicles dumping garbage in uh, urban deprived areas and in in near villages. Uh, basically, so those people get uh, exposed to flies and insects, dengue, mosquitoes. Um, the water can get polluted. So this again, obviously, is going to affect the public health, mm. not just of that localized area, but of you know the larger area as well. So, for instance, if industrial waste is being uh, not treated and it's being dumped into the water bodies, uh, then the food that we consume, the fruits, vegetables, um, and even direct exposure to some of these uh, chemicals, heavy metals, is going to cause a lot of public health problems. We also have, uh, you know, differential access to safe uh, and drinking water. Uh, so you might have one street uh, where the water is being supplied like every alternate days and even just the next street might have supply like once in four or five days. Again, openly discriminatory uh, treatments of different people living within the same city. Again, nutrition, uh, science is not the basis for many of the decisions around nutrition or food to be made in the country. You have uh, people talking about sattvic and tamasic and rajasic uh, kind of food. Um, sattvic food is being pushed to children who actually need very nutrient-dense foods, who, who need healthy foods. Um, and instead, the, the, those foods are being labeled as tamasic and rajasic. Uh, we are being told that this food is, uh, uh, you know, causes lust and it causes criminal, uh, criminal thoughts. Uh, it causes lack of concentration. And uh, it uh, just this kind of uh, uh, false uh, misconceptions uh, actually contribute to the malnutrition crisis in uh, India. And, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar has talked about this and he says that uh, the role of the state, the social determinants is very important, uh, whether it's food. He talks about nutritious food. He just doesn't say just say food because what happens in many of the, uh, you know, even in the right to food campaigns, uh, people tend to talk a lot about grains. They say cereals or millets, um, and they don't talk about nutrition. So I think that's very important what he says. Uh, he talks about the need for a stable income, uh, clean drinking water, and also he talks about inequalities uh, which uh, affect uh, one's access to health, and that one, need, one cannot just look at medicines and hospitals, but also has to look at the a social reality which is in India. I think this is very important. Um, and even if we follow just this uh, one advice uh, of Dr. Ambedkar, I think we will have a hugely 
you know, better public health system in India. And also he connects uh, air pollution with health and uh, he says that electricity should be subsidized. Uh, basically, uh, in the absence of electricity, people will use uh, fuels which are bad for their respiratory system. And, uh, you know, subsequently studies have also showed this, that uh, when women are constantly exposed to, say, a fuel, which is, <clears throat> you know, has a lot of smoke and a lot of pollution, then they are more likely to uh, be at risk of tuberculosis and other respiratory infections. And again, he, uh, Dr. Ambedkar has said this, that pro poverty prevents many of our countrymen from obtaining nourishing food. And again, poverty itself uh, has um, many reasons. Um, even now, like uh, we see a lot of researchers who tend to blame communities. Like they might say, you know, Dalit communities are um, undernourished. Um, Adivasi children are more stunted. And then they'll attribute it to, you know, the parents don't care about the children. The mothers uh, don't invest time. Mothers are ignorant. Mothers don't you know, have awareness which is not true because uh, a lot of communities do have very good knowledge and understanding about foods, um, traditional foods. They know what is nutritious. Uh, you know, even if uh, uh, say, uh, you know, a mother doesn't have a lot of money, she might go and buy organ meats, which she, you know, has been taught or she knows and she understands it is a very nutrient dense food. Uh, but then, obviously, there are barriers for people to access this. And uh, looking at some of the indicators, uh, it's very uh, concerning. Um, the most recent that we have is a National Family Health Survey, and we also have the Comprehensive National Nutrition Survey, uh, both of which show very high levels of uh, malnutrition in India. And um, it's more in children... Um, and women and others uh, of the from the marginalized communities, we have a stunting of almost thirty seven percent. Basically, it means that children are of less heights than expected for their age. Undernutrition is less weight than expected for their age, and uh, uh, you know a body mass index of less than eighteen point five uh, means that person is on a starvation diet, and we have. Uh, that also in the country in huge numbers. And of course, it varies between states, uh, but overall, uh, these are the statistics. And post-COVID, we have expect, we expect all of these to actually have gone up uh, because of, you know, uh, loss of um, access to income and many other reasons. And these are the nutritional deficiencies in children. Uh, this is important because, um, you can see that most of the nutrients are deficient. So it's important to uh, recognize this uh, because sometimes we might see the clinical sign of one of these deficiencies. So we might see, say, a child in the OPD uh, who has a zinc deficiency, who has clinical signs. So just giving the child zinc, um, you know, syrup of zinc and sending them home is not going to be enough. You need, you need to replace most of the other nutrients as well. But in India, what, what is happening is, for example, there's a lot of anemia in India. So what um, the solution by the bureaucrats uh, is to uh, fortify rice. So anyway, you're eating rice, uh, which is not a nutrient-dense food. And rather than increasing uh, the diversity of foods, rather than making sure people eat foods which have you know high nutritious value, you, you say we'll add iron to the rice. And studies show that this is not useful because to treat anemia, it's not enough just to replace iron. You need to replace uh, many other nutrients. And that can happen only with, uh, you know, giving diverse foods to people. Again, the, you know, the consumption of most foods is very low. Vitamin A rich foods is very low. Um, iron rich foods consumption is very low. Only 9% of children as early as 6 to 23 months have received iron-rich foods. Egg consumption is very low and flesh foods, basically like uh, fish, chicken, uh, meats, is very com very low consumption of this food. And when we talk of diversity, we say that you should have at least 
uh, four or more of these major food groups. And these food groups are cereals and millets, uh, pulses and legumes, milk and dairy, uh, meat, poultry, fish and eggs, fats and oils, and vegetables and fruits. And all of these are important. So in India, what is happening is uh, because we have this whole myth that India is a vegetarian country, uh, and we also want to give the cheapest foods to people. We want to invest as little as possible. What happens is whether it's the public distribution system or whether it's the ICDS that is in the Anganwadis or in the midday meal scheme, it's very cereal heavy. Um, and if they want to have diversity, then they might say add millets or they might give very watery dal with that. But that's completely not enough uh, in terms of a nutrient density. We need to have, uh, you know, milk, dairy, uh, which have many nutrients. Um, uh, milk has growth factor, which uh, helps, you know, if you have two groups and to one group you give milk, that group is likely to be taller. Um, you know, it helps to gain heights. Uh, meats, uh, poultry, fish, eggs, uh, again, uh, very nutrient dense, uh, very good quality nutrients. And you get a lot of vitamins and minerals. So even if you say eat 100 grams of beef, you will get a very good quality proteins and most of the other vitamins that your body needs and most of the minerals that your body needs. Again, fats and oils are very important. There's a misconception that if you eat fat, you become fat. Um, but actually, the main reasons for people putting on weight is um, sugars, a lot of carbohydrates and cheap oils. Uh, basically, uh, you know, to have industrially manufactured oils, uh, which uh, are highly processed. And when these are heated, they release trans fats, which can cause metabolic changes in the body and uh, which can you know, lead to obesity and other uh, diseases like uh, diabetes, hypertension, and heart-related diseases. Um, again, vegetables and fruits uh, serve a purpose. They, they can give you a good supply of vitamins and mainly vitamins. And again, like Dr. Ambedkar has said that India is not a homogeneous country and uh, that we have to recognize the diversity. And, you know, diversity among people is good, but diversity of food is also important. Diversity of culture is also important. And I think uh, we need to challenge this narrative that, you know, we need to have one language, one food, uh, you know, I don't know, everything. They want to homogenize everything. Um, and that is not the best way forward. Um, and definitely in terms of nutrition, um, having, you know, one kind of food, just cereals or millets uh, is definitely not, um, you know, good sound public health. These are some of the nutrient dense um, animal source foods. Um, uh, so make sure that you see all of it and... Uh, you know, <clears throat> this is what the science says, not ideology. And, uh, but if you look at what's actually happening in practice, uh, you have like organizations like Akshay Patra, which has been given the contract across the country uh, to give midday meals to children. Again, they uh, follow a sattvic diet, uh, which is completely inadequate. Uh, they refuse to give eggs. Uh, they say that... Um, Eggs are the <clears throat> menstrual discharge of the hen or chicken. Um, they say it, it leads to, uh, you know, criminalized uh, criminal thoughts. It, it creates the uh, uh, lustful thoughts, and therefore they refuse uh, completely. They've also captured a lot of the state power, um, which means uh, it's very difficult to, you know, get them to even follow government guidelines. Uh, because they are over and above the normal regulations. Then you have, uh, you know, taboos around uh, giving eggs. Um, many schools refuse to give eggs, uh, even though uh, if you look at the nutritional content of egg, it's, it's considered as a complete food. Um, a, a child in, in the midday meal scheme is expected to get around 12 to 20 grams of protein. And one egg, that is a 160 gram egg, can give almost eight grams of protein and it's very good quality protein. So again, among proteins, there's different qualities. 
um, some of them are absorbed well, some of them, like the food itself, like for example, uh, spinach um, might have vitamins, but it also has phytates and oxalates and tannins, which prevent absorption of these nutrients. Whereas eggs and you know, other animal source foods, they, do, they don't have these um, inhibitors of absorption. But that, that's what the science is. And clearly science is um, not of much consequence when it comes to decision-making around food. We also have, you know, this uh, targeted attack, um, especially on beef, um, which is one of the most nutrient-dense foods, especially organ, uh, beef liver and, you know, other organ meats are very easily accessible in, in sense of cost. Uh, it's very nutritious, but, uh, you know, it's, it's targeted. Uh, laws are being passed uh, against people eating beef. So again, clearly, science is uh, taking a back seat here. And uh, we also have this, uh, you know, I mean, all of you must be aware of uh, this whole sanitizing spaces, you, aircrafts, they say we don't want meat, then uh, higher education, which is supposed to be scientific spaces, again, completely based on prejudice, uh, exaggerated, uh, you know, fragility syndrome, where you don't even want someone to talk about uh, certain foods. And that translates also, like for example, doctors. If you go to a doctor um, and the doctor is uh, so-called pure vegetarian, they're not going to advise you, even if say you have anemia, of which the best uh, treatment is um, organ meat or red meat. The doctors won't say it because somehow they feel that saying the word itself is polluting for them. And this is again being abused uh, by uh, um, uh, you know corporates uh, basically like a caste and a corporate nexus uh, where multinationals um, trying to push plant-based foods trying to push for veganism um, trying to say that India is a role model um, you know it's 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 like a caste and a corporate nexus um, and again it's usually problematic for the country um, and again, it's a reason why you need representation in decision making. You need, if you know, you have a group of vegans and vegetarians deciding what India should eat, then um, obviously we're going to have malnutrition in the country. Then again, uh, if you look at the health system itself, uh, within the health system, on the one hand, you have the doctors, mostly male, mostly from the oppressor caste groups, you know, who are treated like gods, who are beyond regulation. Uh, you know, you cannot question them. And on the other side, within that same healthcare system, you have people who are doing the so-called traditional unclean occupations, who are handling the dead bodies, who are handling the excreta, who are handling the waste uh, generated in the hospital. And <clears throat> It's very unequal in the way that, you know, two groups are treated, um, the wages that they receive. So the doctor might be getting like two or three lakhs a month. And then you have the uh, people who the so-called group D or the people who are sweeping the streets and collecting the hospital waste, um, who sometimes don't get paid even for months. They have to, you know, they are on contract. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, you know, they, they, they face a lot of uh, harassment, a lot, lot of bullying. <clears throat> if you see the kind of equipment that they're given, um, it's very uh, primitive kind of uh, equipment, which again contributes a lot to their occupational hazards. So basically occupational hazard is uh, a health problem that arises because of the work you do. So they are exposed to a lot of toxins, they are more. They can, you know, because uh, they uh, handle the glass pieces and they handle syringes and needles and chemicals. So they can have exposure to some of those chemicals. They can have needle prick injuries. They are at more risk of HIV, uh, hepatitis, tuberculosis. Um, also, physical because sometimes they, you know, have to lift heavy loads, and uh, most of the time they're not protected. And again, psychologically. 
there's a lot of abuse and harassment and bullying and discrimination that they face. The kind of language that is used, um, you know, it's very abusive, very sexist, and you know, sometimes sexually abusive language, casteist language. And uh, then there's all that is discrimination within the system, but you also have discrimination by the system. Um, if you see, you know, who accesses the public health services, who accesses the private health services, um, the kind of investment that is going into the public services and the private sector, you know, a lot of time they say we are uh, general merit, but actually a lot of the time they've just paid for their seats. Um, and, uh, you know, very often if you look at the medical colleges, uh, where people pay for their seats, there's hardly any training or teaching that is happening. Uh, basic ethics are not taught to the students. For them, it's more like a business. Um, you know, their parents would have set up some private clinic for them or a private hospital, and all they have to do is go and manage that. And uh, uh, we keep hearing, I mean, and we saw during COVID as well, the kind of charges people were having to pay like 40,000 a day. Uh, you know, for a bed uh, during the COVID pandemic, uh, people are made to undergo unnecessary procedures, unnecessary investigations. And uh, this uh, private hospitals create something called the standard, like uh, national accreditation board for hospitals and healthcare providers. So basically those standards um, can only be met by large corporate hospitals. So it basically uses um, the system to remove competition. So the charitable hospitals, the smaller missionary hospitals, uh, most of them don't stand a chance uh, because of these kind of standards and uh, they usually lose out um, this kind of a system. Then, um, like, as we all know, uh, based on one's religion, based on one's caste, gender, geography, uh, whether you're from a rural area or an urban area, which urban area, if you're from a posh area, or from a poorer area, if you're a migrant worker, the language, sometimes language is a barrier to access uh, healthcare services. One's occupation can be a barrier. Um, you know, if, if someone is the so-called unclean occupation or if uh, someone is doing sex work, or, you know, the, the way the system treats them is very different. Um, most of them, may not feel like coming back to the system again because they face um, abuse or negligence or even discrimination. Again, sexual orientation uh, is a reason for uh, discriminatory behavior. We have like friends, like say who's, who's transgender, who might go with just a cough and a cold and you know they ask very um, intrusive questions about their sexual life or you know their genitalia which is again, you know, abuse of power by the system. And uh, during COVID, we saw what happened, you know, with the uh, labeling uh, the Tablighi Jamaat group as the cause for the pandemic, which is ridiculous and is unscientific. Even doctors were participating in that. And that translated directly to the Muslim community being targeted, uh, being discriminated, being abused. Um, there was economic boycotts, um, healthcare system also, uh, you know, discriminated against them. And it actually, you know, it had real consequences for the community in terms of their livelihoods, in terms of their health. And we also see increasingly telemedicine, which is basically a doctor sitting in, you know, somewhere in the city in a, a sanitized space and talking to people via uh, you know, uh, either WhatsApp or, or Zoom or some other means. And it, it, so basically, there's no interaction with the patient and there's no physical interaction. Um, and what happens is um, because you don't touch your patient and because you don't examine the patient clinically, you end up missing a lot of the diagnosis. And therefore, you tend to do uh, tests so instead of examining, so for example, I might touch a patient and say, okay, there's a lymph node and it you know, feels like a tuberculosis lymph node, or I look at eyes and say, oh, the patient looks a bit anemic. But since I'm not examining the patient, I end up 
prescribing a lot of tests, some of them expensive, and then asking people to come from, you know, at a distance to the hospital, which is in the center, centralization of healthcare. And the more you move people from their place of residence, the more expensive it is for them. So asking someone who maybe is a daily wage laborer, saying, you know, you might have a cancer, to come to Bangalore or come to Pune or come to Delhi means, you know, they have to lose their daily wages, means someone has to accompany them. Um, they have to spend when they come to the city. And out-of-pocket expenditure for health is one of the most catastrophic form of um, expenditure that people have. Because of health, people have had to sell their assets. They've had to loan you know, take loans, which are, again, very exploitative. They might have had to sell property or livestock. So it is, you know, um, it is not the best form of health care, and it's definitely not good public health. And then we also have this whole Ayush versus allopathy. Now, Ayush has a role, but if you look at the, historically, what was traditional, like we had a lot of communities, like, for example, uh, traditional birth attendants were mostly Dalit women who used to go um, and they had a lot of oral history. So they had no written history because most of them were not uh, allowed to be educated, uh, but they had a lot of knowledge and wisdom. And uh, that those practices get banned. So they say that, you know, these women are dirty, they cause maternal deaths, they ban those practices. But some of those they sanitize it. Like, for example, she might use, you know, she might use animal source uh, foods and she might use plant-based foods and herbs. But then you eliminate all the animal source foods. You take only the plant-based. You sanitize it, basically, and you call it Ayurveda. And then you market it. Now, what happens is um, Ayurveda and, you know, some of these other practices, they don't have due diligence. So for due diligence, you basically need to do the research. You need to do the regulation. Um, many of these products which are mass manufactured have a lot of toxins, have a lot of heavy metals, which lead to side effects. So for, as you can see on the slide, the Food Safety Standards Authority of India has downplayed the regulations if it's mentioned in an Ayurvedic textbook. So they've listed some 60 books of ancient textbooks and they say if it comes from there, then there's no real need to regulate it, which is ridiculous because, uh, you know, it's not scientific. But, you know, that's the problem uh, with uh, in these kind of uh, systems. Um, again, talking about reservation, uh, it's a problem. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of you know about uh, Dr. Payal Tadvi, and of course, there are many, 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 many people who uh, access higher education and who have to face extreme toxicity, uh, blatant casteism, equating uh, people who come in through affirmative action as lacking in merit, uh, which is not true, obviously. And uh, like with Dr. Payal Tadvi, she, she she was, uh, you know, uh, from the Beel Muslim community and uh, she was doing gynecology. She was not being allowed to uh, practice huge amounts of bullying and harassment, like some of the language that was used for her. You know, it's, it's very, um, I don't know, I mean, just to hear this, that language, you feel like very sick and she had to go through all of that. And uh, they try to access support. They, they complain to different bodies and they did not receive um, any support. And finally, she took her life. But what was uh, concerning is after that, um, you know, a lot of doctors wrote and they said, uh, you know, doing medicine is anyway very stressful. So people who are not ready to handle that kind of stress shouldn't be doing medicine. But basically blaming her, you know, for, for whatever she went through. So I think it's important to differentiate between incidents. Like all of us at different points can undergo, uh, you know, bullying or some senior who's misbehaving or some staff or professor who's misbehaving. 
versus a structural kind of bullying where you don't have any system to support you, you don't have any peer group to support you, you don't have anyone who's on your side. Um, you are not able to complain, you're not able to, you know, have any access to justice, then, you know, you call it a structural uh, bullying or structural harassment. And that's how caste operates. Um, many of the higher educational institutional spaces are very toxic. And uh, we see what's happening in the public domain. Like, you know, on social media, people are openly uh, caste is they're openly Islamophobic, uh, openly, you know, uh, sexist, and they get, you know, a lot of people supporting them. So imagine the scale of it in, in the private space. And the, it seriously needs to be addressed uh, because a lot of people are going through it on their own. Um, and then to, you know, higher education itself is stressful. And then to have to face this is, is you know, unfair. And, uh, you know, Dr. Ambedkar talks about the idea of literal pollution and a notional pollution. And, uh, you know, people might say, I don't practice untouchability. I'm, I, I, uh, I'm not, you know, it's not very visible. But I think there are a lot of these uh, notional ideas or practices of untouchability where you intrinsically believe uh, that a person do, does not belong, belong to a certain space, that a person is meant to do certain occupations, uh, which their parents and, you know, their grandparents have done. Uh, education is meant for a few, you know. Uh, I think that uh, notion is, plays a very important um, role in this mindset um, against reservation. And, uh, you know, the burden should be on the oppressor communities to prove that they're not casteist. So for example, if you someone has to be promoted or someone has to become a mentor or supervisor, then if there is a record on them of being casteist, then they should not be allowed to you know these kind of spaces. They should not be allowed to handle power. Um, and unless there are consequences, um, I, I, I mean, uh, of course, you need a larger group to discuss on this, but I'm saying unless that uh, power structure is broken, um, we're not going to be able to make these spaces less toxic. And again, uh, I just have a, like a few more slides. Um, again, if you look at policy making, we don't really have policy makers in India. Uh, we have people who locate themselves because of their caste uh, or class privilege and locate themselves as policy makers. Um, most of them are not held accountable. For, for example, for COVID, you had a whole bunch of people who suddenly became the experts who were making decisions, and most of the decisions were problematic. Uh, it, 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 you know, there was huge morbidity, there was huge mortality, uh, COVID related, and also non COVID conditions. So people. Uh, lost access to TB medicines, to HIV medicines, to uh, kidney dialysis. Uh, children were not able to access cancer treatment, pain management. So, you know, nobody has been held accountable for this. I think that it's important that if people are claiming to be experts, then they also need to be held accountable for bad decisions. And the same, if you look at nutrition, uh, the fact that they've pushed cereal and millets and criminalized all the other foods and therefore contributed to the huge malnutrition in the country, someone has to, you know, be held accountable for it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, like, this is what Dr. Ambedkar says about equity. Um, he, he, you know, he gives this very nice example of uh, chicken soup. And it's nice he said chicken soup because to someone else, they would have said curd rice or I don't know, dal and roti or something. And he's, he took a nutrient dense food like chicken and he says, if someone is sick, you'd give that person a little more food and no one should resent that. So, understanding that society, it's not like you know, you're getting affirmative action, therefore I want EWS, which is you know, ridiculous. You need to understand, and this particular thing. Uh, what you know, Dr. Ambedkar 
uh, says that you cannot treat the strong and the weak, the rich and the poor, all on the same footing. And, uh, you know, when people talk about the creamy layer um, and they don't talk about the other caste groups who have had generations of wealth um, and don't expect them to give up their privileges and don't understand that representation is important. Like, for example, if we had more meat eaters making food policies, we wouldn't have had this malnutrition crisis. And that's why, you know, reservation in all fields, um, even, uh, you know, especially at policy making level is very important. And uh, he, you know, he places the responsibility on the government for this. Uh, that the government has to fulfill its role, whether it's education or public health, um, and you know most of the social determinants of health. And I think uh, if we take some of his uh, advice, uh, we would be able to improve the public health in the country. So I end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful session. We are really glad to hear from you. Uh, I would really appreciate uh, bringing up your real-life examples and the uh, field work that you did and giving us a realistic view about public health and ambedkarism. I really like the fact when you spoke about um, how it's important to emphasize on science rather than ideology. And specifically speaking about women and how they're uh, emphasizing on health is really important, not only for the nation, but also their own family. Uh, I really appreciate bringing up the point about uh, how there is a, a criminalization of particular food items uh, when it comes to uh, probably a beef or chicken. Uh, and uh, particularly for particular uh, particular religions, which should not happen. And uh, um, what I really appreciate is um, bringing up the grassroots loopholes that are very uh, prominent and uh, people are really ignorant about it. Um, and how one can overcome that fact by bringing up more of policymakers who are not vegans or who are not vegetarians and uh, influencing more of uh, overall development and overall uh, food and a balanced diet that uh, can help uh, in the welfare of the people. Uh, that And uh, when you spoke about Baba Sahib's uh, aspect, when he spoke about the uh, state's role and how uh, there is an aspect of stable income, inequalities, water sources, and social reality, that connects uh, uh, the health of a particular country and the economy of a particular country. Uh, and when you spoke about the male dominance, that was a thing that really caught my eyes. When you spoke of male dominance and particularly upper caste male dominance, uh, that really impacts the public health system and uh, is uh, creating a barrier for particularly women and uh, uh, lower caste women, probably Dalit women, uh, to come up as you said, they have a great amount of knowledge, but they were not able to speak at that point. But now we can see, like, we will see things okay. change and bringing more of uh, their representation and their population in front uh, and bringing that uh, barrier down. Also, um, the thing where you said about uh, pollution, the mindset, the notion that people have about food, the characterization of food that uh, people have created in their mind and looking very differently when you spoke about, when you gave us the real life examples and the real life news is where you spoke about how a couple was um, not lynched uh, more, uh, uh, in public where they were seen carrying, uh, I think, these things. 
so i really uh, appreciate you bringing all these real life examples so that it can have a more impact on us and people in this meeting can really get influenced by you and try to see things very differently and through a perspective of more e equity uh, and uh, bringing up things in that manner and not a very um, prejudiced uh, and a very prejudiced and a old type of thinking where you really are not open to different ideas thank you ma'am uh, so uh, Mm, ladies and gentlemen the floor is open for questions if anyone of you have any questions feel free to raise your hand uh, use a microphone or uh, put the questions in the chat box any doubts or any queries okay yes uh, sir could you please unmute yourself thank you yeah please share briefly about yourself and then you can say your comment sorry uh, my question is that uh, in this lecture, in this in, uh, discourse, mostly the focus has been on the health policy and the intervention of government in various, various areas. Wide spectrum of areas have been touched upon which relate to the healthcare system in the country. However, uh, in the healthcare system today, there are private players who are operating big hospitals and they have also set up their own practice. They also are following the same, uh, say, discriminatory practices, as well as they have no accountability. Though the account issue of accountability has been touched upon, but that uh, issue has been touched upon from more governmental perspective. Whereas uh, self-regulation, as well as strong regulation in uh, the field of those who operate healthcare in private sector, as well as those who are into medical education in the private sector. So therefore, there are no strong actually regulation upon them and they are not held accountable for all their follies. And we have seen that happening in COVID where the interest of private hospitals and private doctors was to profit maximization rather than giving some relief or some real health care to the people. So how that issue could be addressed in a country as big as like India? And my second point is the telemedicine, uh, say, a solution reminds me of a reference which Baba Sahib Ambedkar himself has recorded in Waiting for Visa, where a Dalit, untouchable woman who is dying no doctor is willing to touch her and uh, some intermediary of uh, middle level caste fellows are brought and then uh, he holds a thermometer and then uh, he administer his hand hands over that thermometer to his uh, lady's husband and he checks whether there is a fever or not so this telemedicine uh, sort of uh, consultation may be moved towards that kind of uh, say regimentation so how we have to have a, a check on more stringent and rigorous checks on private practitioner in healthcare, both in education as well as rendering health services. Yeah, I mean, um, I very much uh, meant all of those for the private sector. Um, if you, I mean, I'm sharing my uh, PPT with uh, Arya and Samiksha. I definitely, uh, most of the comments you made uh, and most of what I said is actually directed uh, towards the private sector because um, whatever regulation is possible, at least the you know public health sector, there is some amount of regulation. You have the DHO and you have some officials who, who you can complain to, but uh, within the private sector, there is very little regulation. Uh, people only have to go to consumer courts and it's very unequal that uh, you have these big, you know, top shot uh, corporate hospitals with their uh, lawyers and on the other side you have a patient who has lost someone who's you know 
face some negligence. It's very unequal, uh, that system, uh, very little regulation. And uh, definitely, um, I think one way of doing it is uh, having uh, more of uh, uh, affirmative action, more of reservations, more people uh, from uh, marginalized communities within policy making, decision making. Um, and I think that uh, would make the system much more, uh, you know, equal and equitable. And again, telemedicine, um, it has a role, but only if there's a functioning healthcare system. In India, we are so crazy about um, being projected as a developed country, you know, Modi stopped this war and Modi stopped that war. And, you know, we always want to project ourselves as somehow uh, some amazing country. Um, and therefore, when telemedicine comes, we feel very proud. We say, oh, we've digitalized healthcare. But healthcare, digitalization of healthcare cannot be a standalone thing. And that is what they're trying to do. They're having telemedicine. They're setting up telemedicine facilities in a rural area where there's no facility. So you just have a computer and people are sitting and talking to the computer. Whereas, say, there's a doctor, there's a nurse, there are, you know, there's a system there. And there's some support for them. Say there's a complicated case and they're not able to understand and they need somebody with some expertise, some specialist. And then you use telemedicine that has a role. But uh, it cannot be a replacement uh, for a you know good quality healthcare system. Thank you, madam. Any more questions? Please feel free to ask questions. I shared the PowerPoint, so some people have asked on the chat for the PPT. Yes. Sure, sure ma'am, we'll, we'll uh, share it. With Uh, excuse me, can I make a point? I'm Dr. Tushar Jakta. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture. I enjoyed quite late for this lecture. I myself is a practicing dermatologist in the city of Mumbai. And uh, one aspect which you highlighted is about telemedicine is uh, absolutely right. Uh, that by employing or uh, making it as the crux of the healthcare delivery system, we are really doing injustice to the patients. And uh, with regards to that, uh, I feel as a doctor, even as a dermatologist, it is uh, nearly impossible to treat the patient because we have to see the patient as a whole and take the detailed history and examination. So that cannot be substituted by telemedicines. And also one more point I would like to make is that we are uh, living in a very difficult times. We are living in a uh, age of, of fraud, I would say. And so there is a necessity uh, for such forums to come out with policy papers and with uh, experts like you that would go a long way in times to come or uh, definitely in the future. Thank you so much. Yes, and also like what you're saying, uh, people, you know, the touch is very important. Uh, you know, a lot of people say that doctor didn't touch me, the doctor didn't touch me. I think it's very, uh, you know, even if it's, not for clinical diagnosis, it, it makes a person feel connected and, you know, it, it has a lot of value uh, to, you know, even just putting, you know, an arm around the person or just, you know, basic examination, checking blood pressure, it makes people feel, okay, this doctor has listened to me and this doctor has examined me. You will lose that uh, with telemedicine. Of Sorry. course, during COVID, it played an important role, uh, uh, but then, People with technology, people who speak and, you know, used to this, uh, tech, you know, technology, they are more comfortable. If it's someone who's in a noisy area, <clears throat> who has poor network, who, you know, not able to communicate, then they are the ones who lose out uh, from this telemedicine. That's true. That's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions?
uh, okay then uh, ma'am we are deeply thank uh, we are deeply thankful uh, for uh, our esteemed speaker selvia ma'am for sharing uh, their insightful and valuable thoughts on ambedkarism in public health i would also like to uh, express my heartfelt gratitude to each one of you who has graced us with their presence uh their presence for this uh, enlightening evening i would also like to express my sincere gratitude to our uh, the organizers of dr b r ambedkar intellectual summit for giving us an opportunity uh, of having such a valuable and thoughtful sessions and having a great lineup of uh, speakers thank you so much yeah thank you ma'am thank you thank you all the best sessions thank you thank you thank you, you ma'am also we uh, deeply appreciate uh, everyone's time and passion who has invested in today's session okay thank you for joining us today jai bhim jai bhim jai bhim